Hello and welcome to another episode of the Midi Era Meets podcast, where we talk to loads of different people from the music world. This month, I'm speaking to Gwyneth Raymond, who is a supremely talented guitarist uh, who plays in the finger style or the American primitive style of playing. Um, all guitar, no uh, lyrics. Um, check out her music; it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, she's released a couple of albums, only only fairly recently, but um, both have been to critical acclaim. And um, yeah, you will be blown away by watching her and listening to her play the guitar. There is now a GoFundMe page for the podcast. If you want to donate to help with the running and the operation of it, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, you can see I've been inundated with donations on the GoFundMe page if you check that out. Great, so uh, I caught up with Guenifer over the internet um, a few weeks ago, and the first question I asked her was about her musical beginnings. Ba- basically, uh, yeah, I was. I remember being about nine or yeah, eight or nine or so, and. Uh, having no interest whatsoever in music, as, you know, a young child of, of, often does, I guess. And then, uh, so I had this little, um, this little, my first Walkman, like a little Sony, brightly coloured little thing that I used to listen to books on, tapes on, because I was a you know, massive nerd. And uh, my mum bought me a copy of uh, Nevermind by Nirvana on tape. And yeah, and that was it. That was like, an, it was like an immediate, an immediate switch. I remember like, just like, you know, put it in my, putting my headphones on and just running around the house, like a little hyperactive maniac, just playing it over and over and over again. And that was really my first kind of musical experience. And that kind of led on to me asking for a guitar for, for my birthday or for Christmas or for whatever it was. And then, you know, kind of finding more, more, more bands in, in that kind of vein, you know, I'm pretty sure Hole was my, was my next cassette. You know, that is uh, Courtney Love. Is that Courtney Love with this, was the singer of Hall, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have been a celebrity skin, I think. Would have been the album. Nice. That seems quite a jump from audio books. I'm imagine what sort of audio books were you listening to um, oh. to go to to then step over to Nevermind. I, I can't honestly. I don't, it was probably stuff like Just William and things like that. You know. Probably pretty, uh, pretty vanilla kind of kid, kid uh, kids, kids books. Yeah, that's amazing. What a radical, what a radical turn it took, thanks to one cassette tape. It really was. It was. It was. It was kind of. It was very, very. I, I just get annoyed when people would play music because you know I just wasn't interested, and then it sort of changed, completely flipped the world on its head. Yeah. Do you know? It's amazing. There's an amazing correlation of. A huge percentage of the people that I've interviewed, I've interviewed, I think, 25 or 26 uh, people now. And it is amazing how many people reference um, Nirvana as being like the primary reason for getting into music. Yeah, I think especially, you know, in, in certain age brackets as well, which are probably p- people who are, you know, we're in quite a broad bracket, I think. But yeah, well, they just they were both very, very easy to listen to, right, because they wrote great pop songs essentially but also were kind of had you know were, had a sort of anarchic raw wild sound to them they, they balanced both both of those things so they were like you know interesting you know it wasn't just banal pop music but also it was really really catchy I and mean, you could see you know you can sing along definitely yeah like heart shaped box and um i mean i remember yeah even going to you'd go to club nights and hear smells like teen spirit and um yeah it was amazing it, it really felt um like it was punk uh as well as being yeah like you say pop and catchy yeah well also because you know they had they would ha- often have somewhat more left field sounding tracks on the on the albums you know, with the with the big pop hits so it was kind of like it was uh like a gateway i think to to weirder noisier stuff hmm and so yeah you where where did you go from from hole and from nirvana what sort of where did you go from there musically uh, well, I kind of, yeah, so I, I started, you know, I picked up guitar on that same time. And then by the time I was uh, a teenager, I was, you know, playing in, in punk and grunge bands around the valleys. And I was listening to a lot of, like a lot of kind of left field punk, like stuff like The Fall and things like that. And I kind of got really into Joy Division uh, and more maybe post-punk stuff like the Butthole Surfers I was super into. Uh, yeah, and I was sort of playing uh, 
in 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 bands in that vein around the valleys uh and then at some point and again it was Nirvana, Nirvana again with their um unplugged album they do a lead belly song and that was interesting to me uh and then also my parents kind of had a lot of that you know 60s 70s east coast american vibe stuff like you know bob dylan and the velvet underground and if you look at the uh history of that of that side of things obviously they were equally very interested in uh early american blues music and they draw a lot from it and and appalachian folk and etc uh so and i dug that music as well it wasn't you know i was i was also kind of into that stuff uh so it was interesting that both what sound like quite different uh, musical genres kind of draw from the same well as it were so yeah i got interested and i started buying these really cheap compilation cds of uh pre-war blues music and they were really cheap because i think a lot of that music is probably you know beyond copyright or oh it's probably you know i mean it's also to do with the 78s collectors etc but yeah i used to, I used to stack them up and i just found you know guys like uh mississippi john hurt and blind boy fuller and blind william mctell and uh all the blind all the blind guys <laughs> you know and uh specifically, Willie Johnson. specifically looking for blind musicians <laughs> yeah yeah they make the best guitar sounds uh yeah and from there i kind of got into blues music and from there i also got into uh the, the more uh folky american stuff so the appalachian pickers and your your uh doc bogs and your uh, and your Roscoe holcomb etc uh and then from there i ended up trying to kind of learn that style of guitar playing uh and i found a, a guy in, in 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 cardiff where i was living at the time who was a really great uh guitar picker uh he was a blues picker rather um especially with the alternating thumb style which is something that guys like uh, john hurt and uh, blind boy fuller would would use a lot and i wanted to learn how to do that well even though you know at that point i'd be playing guitar for years and years and years uh but i thought it was worth you know talking to someone who really had it down uh, and it was you know just interesting and he then uh, introduced me to uh the works of uh john fay and that led into the American American primitive scene from there, and and you know, the story continues as it were. Superb. And what is the alternating thumb style out of interest for the layman? Like oh, so alternating thumb. Yeah, it's it's basically a way of self self accompanying yourself when you play guitar. So if especially if you're playing very, if you, it, well, it's used a lot if you're playing instrumental guitar. So it's kind of the primary technique used by American primitive pickers but it was also used by uh by early blues players essentially yeah it's a way of accompanying yourself so the alternating thumb is your thumb is playing a bass line and typically it'll be alternating between two strings hence why it's called an alternating thumb to give it like a boom 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 kind of sound mm-hmm. uh, and then you with the rest of your fingers you're picking out the melody so it can it can make it sound like there's more than one guitar playing at the same time Cool. Oh, thank you for explaining that. I will be asking stupid questions throughout the uh, interview, but that makes perfect sense. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, um, yeah, so you grew up in Cardiff. You mentioned Cardiff there. Um, And the valleys are, of course, surrounding surrounding Cardiff. Where, Where did you grow up? Like, was it in Cardiff? No, I grew up. I I I grew up originally uh, in a in a small village, uh, some some way north of Cardiff, just at the start of the South Wales Valleys, a little village called Taftswell. Oh, Taftswell, really? Well, fun on Tav, if you wish. Yeah, I used to work at Nangaru um, for Company's oh, okay. House, so yeah. I used to cycle up. I used to cycle up the um, the Taft Trail to go to work from from yeah. Cardiff every morning. Yeah, there you go then. <laughs> Yeah, so I know it's beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful out there. Yeah, yeah, right at the foot of the Garth Mountain, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I noticed that in one of your uh, your album titles. I was like, I recognise the name of Garth, and I had to sort of look. I was like, oh yeah, I cycled past it every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it is, yeah, it's a beautiful a beautiful part of the world, isn't it? Um, what were you doing in bands? Um, what were you, what was your role in bands like when you were playing in collectives? What were you doing? Uh, I actually started off playing in bands as a, as a drummer. Uh, I think I played my first gig when I was maybe I think I just turned fourteen or something. I ended I ended up depping in my uh, elder brother's noise band in, uh, <laughs> in the in the, Wel- in the Welsh club in Cardiff. So yeah, I started out playing playing drums for qu- quite a few years, uh, and then and then eventually just changed to playing. Cause I you know I, I was I was a guitar player, but just you know just for myself. 
and then eventually after you know a good number of years decided to to have a pop at playing the guitar instead but yeah it was mostly just you know punk and grunge loud noisy loud noisy fun stuff you know it's still fun great yeah i mean um i've yeah i've spent many a time in pubs in and around cardiff and i I don't think there's an atmosphere like it when there's a live band playing in like a small pub in the, no- the middle of nowhere. Yeah, um, absolutely. Some yeah, glorious I moments. Yeah, some of the best gigs I've ever played have definitely been, especially with the with when I was you know doing the punk band thing, has have been in you know little little villages and towns in the middle of nowhere because you get like every single kid from the town turns up because there's nothing else to do there, and they go and they go mental. Those are always the best gigs by far. Definitely. I think it's a great part of the world. I've got really fond memories of living in Cardiff. Um, it sort of had a sensibility. It's like, has it like a town mentality in the city? It's just a, yeah, it's just a good town. I love Cardiff. I kind of I kind of miss it sometimes. Although, you know, Brian's pretty cool too, so. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll go on to Brighton a bit later. So that was amazing that you found you managed to find a blues, a blues uh, teacher in... Uh, when you were starting out so um yeah so you went from being a drummer and then yeah where what 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 sort of development did you go from when you started to play guitar like solo um well yeah I was just originally I just wanted to to learn it I had nothing more than just you know curiosity I wanted to be able to play uh you know John Hurt songs effectively that really was it I started off learning John Hurt songs and um from there I guess I just started, I'm really bad at learning whole songs. I've got like a terrible attention span. So I'll, I usually learn about 30 seconds and then that's kind of it for me. And I'll start, you know, mucking about with it. Mm-hmm. And from that, I ended up, I just started to write my, my own little tunes. And um, I'm, you know, I can't sing a note. So they would consequently become quite, you know, complicated, I guess, in terms of the composition uh, as instrumental pieces. And it never occurred to me that that, could actually just be a thing and I think uh yeah I started this was at the time that I, I, I was uh seeing this teacher and uh, I started showing him him these little these little bits that I was writing and these sort of songs these instrumental compositions that I'd written and and he then that was when he introduced me to to John Fay because you know to to illustrate the fact that this was actually kind of a musical genre already of this instrumental vaguely avant-garde American uh, guitar instrumentals which drew heavily from from early american blues and folk music hmm that's superb i mean um yeah sort of great to have that i think it's great to go on your own adventure and and go down whatever you feel like you want to do with something and it is amazing to then find people throughout history who've been doing similar things or they've been on a similar sort of journey to you yeah yeah Certainly, because the the people that you reference of um, were born in sort of the nineteen the very early nineteen hundreds, um, or nineteen twenties and thirties. Um, so yeah, the, your lives correlated in some way. I think that's really amazing. Yeah, you know, well, it's all it's all just a long story, isn't it? I don't think nothing really changes in the long run. Uh, it's uh, the reason why, you know, the reason why people liked certain forms of music <laughs> early on right is the same reason as we like everything like i i've always said that punk music is essentially just con- well you know somewhat contemporary folk music it's kind of drawn from the same thing of it's uh, uh, un un unschooled right it has a sort of diy aspect to it so essentially it it is just folk music yeah definitely how would you define punk music uh, folk, folk music. Uh, yeah, no, I uh, know. Just, uh, oh yeah, unschooled DIY music. I guess it's just something that is being, yeah, attacked from a, from a, a an, uh, I don't know what the word would be, and yeah, an unschooled sensibility, uh, just that desire to put something out there, and and not to attempt to do something that is fits into a particular school or or thought of music right i mean and at least initially obviously everything everything becomes everything becomes a cult eventually i know this became a thing in the uh in the uh in the in the punk movement in the 70s and 80s where uh you know initially it was just this thing where you don't have to play guitar solos you know because preceded it right was there was a, there was that kind of whole 
prog, prog, prog music thing. Mm-hmm. And so the punk attitude was, we don't have to be good at playing guitar. We don't have to play endless guitar solos. We're just going to spit out this song. And then, and that was kind of the, the, you know, the beautiful attitude about it, right? You didn't have to be, you didn't have to be anything to create it. And then later on, uh, in the punk movement, it became you are not allowed to play a guitar solo, <laughs> and then it becomes authoritative again, right? So everything everything goes in cycles. like expression of a feeling a bit like i think uh kurt cobain used to say like his the there a lot of nirvana songs would come out of them just getting a sound you know like playing together and then and then the words would be sort of like an afterthought for, for what they were doing it was yeah i guess like that that idea of expressing yeah. yourself without words um yeah which is also something that you've you've talked about isn't it um uh i have i do have a note on that somewhere but yeah you sort of said you prefer the expression of playing a singular instrument without words why 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 is that i just think there's certain things that are like the entirety of like the human experience or like whatever you want to think of is not necessarily you know it's kind of more complicated than 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 our language has evolved to allow to express it's and especially maybe i don't know maybe the greatest poets to have ever lived could 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 feasibly do it but for most people it's hard <laughs> right i'm not the most articulate uh, person in the world myself but uh there are certain concepts i think that are very difficult if not impossible to put into words like we've got words right we've got words like melancholic right i mean you kind of know what melancholic means but i guess it's kind of maybe it's like that thing with the um of inuit having a, a, a you know a hundred words for snow or whatever right maybe if we, we could conceivably come up with a uh, hundred different words for the specific modes of melancholia right but then you're kind of but then you're quantizing it into these very specific things and and music doesn't really work like that music is it, it has it, it it kind of presents this continuum of of emotion, right? And it has this idea that you're creating like a, a land. You're making like a sonic landscape, which kind of rep- represents a, a, a world of of feeling somehow. Uh, and yeah, which are things that you, you, you when you kind of you you know what you feel, but you can't you can't say it. And sometimes you just feel like yeah, that 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 sound is it and i don't really know what it is i'm not i can't analyze myself enough to know what it is that i'm feeling but that that thing right there is is it you know absolutely it's, it's really hard to explain because you're trying to explain why you can't use words to why you can't use words to say these things through words <laughs> yeah, it's possible. like sort of asking you to explain it explain and annoy i think actually in the day today i don't know if you know the day today with chris morris he does ask one of the reporters to sum sum up the story in a noise um which is just like yeah just a bit stupid but um yeah it's i don't know if you've ever experimented with psychedelics in any uh any time i certainly have now and again and uh i think yeah the univo the one unifying thing people experience when taking them is that language is fairly meaningless in comparison to the other things you know well, it's just that thing where you have to send your know, languages. It's, it's, uh, it's a set of discrete expressions, right? So you only have whatever as many combinations as you have words to create a, a thought. Mm-hmm. So effectively, there is you, you know just just numerically a limit. Yeah, I th- I like the way that you describe that, and also the yeah the quantizing of the of the feelings. What's interesting is uh, in Russian, in Russia in r- the Russian language, I guess yeah. Also, like obviously, languages change between countries, but they in the Russian language they have lots of words for emotion that we don't have. Like they have they've really categorized emotion in a really beautiful and articulate way, whereas we just go happy, sad in English. Um, and obviously there are, you know, there's variant variations on them, but, um, yeah, it's interesting that in Russian they do express emotion in, in a sort of a deeper level than, than what we would. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, 
can we just start the mention of um, a few sort of numerical and uh, programming type words that you've that you've related to language? You also do programming for a living, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I make yeah, I work in video games essentially. Yeah, as, as a coder. Yeah, that's really cool. When did you When did you get into computer games? When did you first start playing games? Well, playing yeah, I, yeah. I, for, as when I was a kid, I think I had a I had a Master System two. For some, for some young birthday that I shared with my, uh, I shared with my brothers, uh, yeah, I just I kind of grew up um, play. I've I've never been actually like a hardcore gamer, which is kind of, obviously strange given that now it's my it's my job, uh, but I was um I I studied astrophysics uh, for a long time and uh, through that I learned computer programming, and I was you know casually playing video games. Uh, in you know, in my spare time, every now and again, and I got just got as I do, I just got curious as to well, how how do you how do you program one of these things? How do you make this thing? And then I just started teaching myself it, and ended up working in it. Yeah. How did you? I mean, I I mean, the the danger of the video get the subject of video games for me is that we could now talk for hours and hours about video games because I I'm a big video game fan. Um, but um. Yeah, I think Mass Mass System Two had Alex Kidd built in. Is that correct? That's yeah, the one. I think there was different editions, but that yeah, I I had the yeah, I had the Alex Kidd in Wonderland when he goes Excellent. to play. Yeah. yeah, I am a super gaming nerd, um, and have had a couple of gaming conversations during the podcast. One guy who worked for Media Molecule on Little Big Planet. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 I know them. So I interviewed um, Kenny Young, who um, did all the music and sound for Little Big Planet, which was really fun. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. Forgotten what. I've forgotten the question I was going to ask now. Um, drop my pen as well. Hold on a minute. Uh, yeah. So through, how did you teach yourself to program then? I just. Well, I mean, I had the basics down from from my work in a, you know as as an astrophysicist. Um, uh, which, but the difference being is that uh, in physics we sort of you doing mostly. Uh, Kind of linear. Well, you just do a slightly different type of programming versus in in uh, in, in 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 video games. It's more like pretty full on uh, object oriented stuff. Uh, so that was the thing I had to learn. I just I just I just started making a game. I really I'm really bad at sitting back and just like learning the fundamentals. I just started. I think I was working in. No, first of all, I got SDL with OpenGL. And I made a little side scroller, and then I started looking at things like Unity. You know, all these, all these uh, engines that people use these days. But yeah, I just started making stuff. I mean, that's how I think that's the best way to learn anything, right? Rather than sitting down and learning your learning your your theory uh, to to the finest tooth and nail. I just I just start making stuff. Chuck it together. It'll be all right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've got a book here which I'll show you now. Um, that's it's just stayed on the shelf, to be honest. Um, I got that from a charity shop. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's good for reference, but your you, your best bet is just to, like, what you can do, you can start with someone else's code, and then you you start playing around with it and see what else you can make it do. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's always the best way. Um, in developing software, like I I make a a couple of uh, like Max for Live devices for Ableton, which are like software plugins. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the early days of that, that's the best advice, what you said there. The early days of that were just ripping apart other people's things and going, how, how the hell does this work? Yeah, definitely. And, and yeah, and where did you, how, what, what led you to uh, study astrophysics? Uh, well, uh, st- <laughs> honestly, Star Trek. Uh, yeah, I loved really? Star Trek when I was, <laughs> when I was, when I was a kid. Uh, yeah, I loved Star Trek when I was a kid. I may have had a uniform uh, <laughs> and uh yeah okay. so space was cool so i wanted to do space stuff so yeah i just did astrophysics i mean honestly wow. that's that's not uh that's not a a, a rare statement i would say roughly 80 percent of every every astrophysicist and astronomer i've met have gotten into it because of star trek <laughs> are they are they um yeah wow well, is that like on the sort of the um the form when you're signing up um, yeah, when you're, yeah. you're applying to university, did you are you doing this course because you a like Star Trek, Star Wars, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? <laughs> Got to fall out and cling on. That's so cool. That's so cool. And what did you do in college to be able to sort of get you to to enable that? Um, in what do you mean, like in sixth form or? Yeah, yeah. 
uh, in maths and physics. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Amazing. I think that's incredible. Yeah, you've not only got a, a master's in astrophysics, but a PhD. Um, yeah, yeah. What were your aspirations with with astrophysics? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I wanted to be a, a scientist, um, you know? do astrophysics but I, I kind of as I especially as I was doing my PhD um, I just found I'm, I'm pretty bad for as I've mentioned before my attention is kind of terrible and I, I, I'm, in, I'm interested in like lots and lots of different things and I like to be able to do lots of different things and especially music right music is super important to me obviously uh, so the thing is about uh, you know scientific academia is that really to do it to any decent level you've got to be completely, completely obsessed. He's basically dedicate 100% of your life to it. And I just, that just wasn't me. So I, I, mm. I ended up deciding that I wasn't going to pursue, uh, I was going fin- to, I would finish my PhD, but not pers- not pursue a path in, uh, in academia due to that. Because I don't want to be able to do other stuff as well, you know? Wow, that seems the amazing, amazing level of, for someone who says that they don't have much of an attention span, that's an amazing level of dedication. Uh, you know, you just, you, 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 I'm good at sticking to things, I guess. Well, maybe not, actually, I'm not good at sticking to things. I'm good at sticking to things to, for for the appropriate period, but then I might need to do something else. That's amazing. That's really, really cool. Um, yeah, so when did you, as a as a sort of solo artist, when did you start gigging and, and how did that all come about? Um. Well... Yeah, I, I guess, so I started gigging originally, I would just, I think I, I was playing in like a, a, a folk band, and I just started occasionally like opening for the band, uh, and then, yeah, I would just play open mics and stuff, uh, and that was when I was still in Cardiff, and then I moved to uh, to Brighton, and again, was just playing little little shows, honestly, I kind of, it was, I was struggling to, 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 to get gigs when I was living in Brighton uh, originally, it was a bit of a to the point where um, I actually considered giving up because I'd played, you know, a couple of dozen shows to absolutely bloody no one, and no, you know, no one seemed interested. It was really hard to get to get uh, any any promoters to 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 put me on. And then uh, one one evening, I was playing a show to to not many people, and really, really seriously saying to myself, "This is it. I think I think this is going to be my last show because I'm just getting." Like, no, you know, I'm getting nothing back. Obviously, you're not you're not doing it for adulation, but it, it is hard to play a million shows with you know two people in the audience who aren't listening. Uh, but anyway, on that night, I had an email from uh, Josh at Tompkins Square, who are uh, a label in San Francisco, who uh, put out a lot of great stuff, a lot of stuff that I uh, you know already owned at that point and was a big fan of, uh, asking me if I would be interested in putting an album out because they had somehow found me from uh, my, by a friend of mine passed my album on to uh uh Jeff Davidson at, at Woofmoo in New York who's a they're a they're a radio station and he really liked it and he played it and he sent it to Josh and Josh is a is a kind of a maniac who does that sort of stuff and went, Ah yeah, I'll put that out. So yeah, from there ended up getting like getting a getting a deal with one of my favourite record labels. <laughs> Isn't it funny how like the moment you totally give up on something and you just like lose all hope that yeah, yeah. some magic, some spark happens. Um, I think that's yeah, incredible, was... especially from yeah, like all the world. way over the other side of the world. It's not like someone in Hastings said, oh, hey, can you, really? you know, it's like it's like adulation from afar. When yeah, it, was, you... it was wild. It was like completely <laughs> out of nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, and so they asked you to make an album. Yeah. Which what uh what yeah, when was that? When when did Tompkins Square approach you? Um oh god, I can't even remember now. It was a couple cuz I'm really slow at putting stuff out. Uh so it was a two two or three years ago, I guess. Amazing. And that was you were never much of a dancer. Yes, yeah. Yeah. That's the one. Where did the title of that come from? Uh, I mean, all my titles are a bit, they're not, very, very, very occasionally it'll be about a specific subject, but usually the song, 
comes first and then typically a title will eventually make itself apparent or in that case an album title it's more like it's that whole thing right of like how things are hard to put into words and they're often quite nebulous my titles because they are about that thing that's kind of a vague that vague sense of something i don't i don't know that just felt like the right title for that album (laughs) Hmm, it's really cool. Yeah, I, I do like a lot. Like your titles are quite enigmatic, and um, yeah, the for, like hell for certain. I love that. That as a yeah. as an as a, as a song title. It's just like you can interpret that however you want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a also it's a place. It's a town in America. Is it? Yep. What hell for certain? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did they call it that? <laughs> well, there's tons of great, great. There's tons of great uh, uh, town names in the states because, yeah, they, they, you know, it's during, during the the the. I guess when they were, um, well, I forgot what the word is, but yeah, yeah, you know, enter, entering the countries where, yeah, they 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 were just given because there's lots of um, they were named after the local business as well, uh, and obviously, you know, it being more modern than most most you know most places got their got their English language names at least, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But America, you know, a lot of spaces only got named like 100, 200 years ago. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's all, you know, there's, what's the, what's the famous one? It's, um, ah, I can't, it's, ah, I've forgotten. It's gone out of my head. There's, there are some amazing, it's worth looking up uh, amazing American town names. I'm certainly going to do that. That's amazing. Yeah. I, did, I was not aware that that was a place name. Um, yep. I want to know who came up with that idea. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, really very well received that first album, you know, a lot of praise from really, um, yeah, you know, the highest level, really. Yeah, I think I think so. It seemed to go down pretty well. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it was nice. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, try, I try not to focus on, 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 on that stuff because either you'll get bummed out if, if it isn't received how you want it to or if it's received too well then you get psyched out so i tried to uh, i tried to just ignore that stuff exactly and i think um it's fair to say you can't control the reaction to you can't control the reaction to your music can you so you can't no, control no, whether just... people love it or they hate it or anything so yeah i think it's a good standing point uh to yeah just to let it be that's so cool. And then did you how what did you do when that album came out to sort of um get it heard? Uh, I just played a, a lot of shows. Uh I kind of managed to get uh, I got uh, a booking agent after that album came out and that helped a lot because I am I really am bad at representing myself uh to people uh, <laughs> and getting shows. Uh so having an agent was was tremendously useful in all of a sudden going from playing you know a handful of shows to playing a, a lot of shows so that's been that's been great so yeah just sort of ended up going around a lot you know lots of shows uh in in europe and uh yeah play a lot of gigs man that's 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 the idea and that's you know I, I, that's the bit I, I like i like touring and playing shows yeah did you go over to america did you play in america too uh i I didn't before the album came out. Sorry, I didn't after the album came out, but I did before. Uh, I went... Uh, so there was a festival just before the album came out. It was uh, whatever year that was, 2018, um, uh, in uh, Tacoma Park, which is just north of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Thousand Incarnations of the Rose Festival, uh, which was this basically an American primitive festival, uh, so Tacoma Park is the hometown of 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 John Fay, which is why it was held there. And it's kind of wild because it's not not exactly a not exactly a huge town, and you had basically every every uh, American primitive player of note that you can think of there. Uh, so you know you had your Glenn Jones and your Daniel Bachman and your Max Oaks and everyone, everyone, Mercer Anderson, Sarah Louise, like every every, every bugger was there. Uh, and so Josh from Tompkins Square just asked me if I wanted to come up and I still I wasn't I didn't play as much the part of the main main program so I ended up playing lots of the, the uh like the little bars and stuff in town um and I played and I played Rhizome which is an amazing uh venue uh, if you're ever in Tacoma Park go to go to Rhizome it's like built basically into a house uh on the edge of town uh yeah so I that, that I so I played in the states then, and then I did also did a show in uh, in uh, Williamsburg around the same time. But that was before the album came out, so that was kind of uh, 
a fun little adventure beforehand. Yeah, what did that feel like to be playing alongside all those the finger finger style greats? Oh, it was wild, yeah. And it was just great. I remember walking in, um, walking walking into the back of Rhizom, actually. It was like a nice hot day. And uh, I think Will Shorber and a couple of guys were there just sitting, playing, playing fiddle and banjo and guitar, like, you know, beautifully, which is just not a thing you really see very, very often, you know, in, in, uh, in the UK. You don't really walk onto someone's back porch and there's like amazing fiddle music happening. <laughs> so it was kind of like walking onto a set of a film, to be honest. That's that's really cool, yeah. Because because you did mention in another interview about being um, sort of um, your style of music didn't really fit with anyone else who was playing, um, which had which had the plus point of meaning that you got put on uh, lineups with a huge variation of other artists. Um, yeah. So yeah, it I must have been it, gone. No, you say it's not. That, I think that that's more like there are plenty of. American primitive pickers, uh, certainly, but it's more that yeah, American primitive doesn't really fit in. It doesn't fit in av- folk music, and it doesn't fit in avant garde music. Or rather, it does fit in in both. So yeah, you end up playing really traditional folk shows, and also, you know, the most hipster avant garde shows available to you in Berlin. Uh, both of which I have done. It's 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 uh, it's great because I actually do genuinely love both those sorts of you know scenes uh so it's 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 quite quite nice really being able to do that yeah definitely sorry to miss miss uh explained that yeah. you're misarticulated your thoughts there i know that's um that's not cool um but yeah i mean you've also been played very recently by Stuart mcconey which is how i came across your music oh okay yeah so uh yeah he has a show called uh the freak zone on a sunday oh. night Yes, no, I do know Freak. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible with names. But yeah, yeah, and Freak Zone, of course. No, I've just done a playlist for Freak Zone, actually. Have you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. It was fantastic. fun. I got to play, I got to pick all my weird stuff. It was great. I was trying to, I was pushing the limits of how obnoxious can I be. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's exactly what Stuart wants. I think that, that would, Good. like, fit the bill. Do you know when that's going to be out? Uh, Yeah, I think it's, it's, um... Let me think. I believe it's. I, mean, I think it maybe Christmas Eve, right? Because it, it's 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 on. They're on at midnight. They make the, those those playlists. So mm-hmm. I think it's midnight as it turns to Christmas Eve. Wow, that's so. Cool. We'll have actually by the time it plays, it will. You know, by the time this comes out, it will have. It will have. It will have been. That's yeah. That's unfortunate. We're speaking in the we're speaking in the past at the moment. The the figurative yeah, yeah, past. That's, right. that's amazing though. Yeah. Um. I love I love Stuart. He's he's a great guy. And um yeah, your your music is really really incredible. It is really really powerful. I've um uh, I've really enjoyed listening to it and um yeah, you sort of describe I don't know if this was your first album or your second, but you described it as being about spooky trees, um black against a gray sky, breath misting in cold air. I this was your second album, wasn't it? Cold Train, yeah, Dead yeah, Men, Personal Tragedies and the Madness of Touring. Um, yeah, I love all of those descriptions. Um, th- there's definitely like a uh, like an ethereal sort of weird darkness to it. Um, yeah, how how do you how do you feel like you express yourself through the guitar? Um, <laughs> uh, I guess I mean certainly I I I do like so I I'm a big fan of 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 riffs as it were right piece like strong strong uh melody lines but at the same time I, I quite like when you just play an absolute you know absolute banger of a riff but then you just you just shift it slightly you know at, it, so maybe towards the end where i always call it playing the playing the wrong note where you you just you 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 kind of finish it in a slightly unexpected place and that that and that you know usually that's just through use of things like um dissonance and that naturally, because it's it's something that's familiar, right? But then there's something just wrong about it, and that's it's almost like the uncanny valley, right? Mm. Or something it's very very close to being what you expect, but there's something not quite right about it. And I think that's that's what like kind of that's good goth gothic stuff, right? I mean, that's kind of what British folk horror is, right? It's like beautiful pastoral scenes, and something is wrong underneath, you know? Mm. Yeah, like the the sort of juxtaposition of 
the the two things together uh sure, the sort of yeah. balance of the imbalance maybe yeah it's just about i don't know <laughs> something pretty with an underlying menace is certainly a, 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 a favorite theme in all in all forms of uh, media for me yeah underlying menace yeah that's a good way of putting it i think that's that's possibly yeah that that is a really amazing way of putting it um yeah i mean your technique is incredible like um the emotion that goes into it uh, as as well as like physically what you're doing as well you must how does it feel to be playing a piece for sort of 10 or 15 minutes like what's happening to you then while while you're doing that um i don't you know you're just sort of quite absorbed because at a certain point of you know when you've been playing uh, for a long time the physical aspect of it isn't really something you, you you think about right it's just it's like completely automatic it's like walking and breathing it just it just happens so it's more that you're kind of listening to yourself play as opposed to thinking about what you're playing and it's just i guess you kind of get into this semi meditative hopefully uh, you know if it, that this is a good show right there's always there's always a bad show when you're you can't get into the right headspace and you're just thinking about what you had for dinner but sometimes when you're, when you're playing a good show you kind of get really drawn in to it. so you're listening to it in the same way as the audience is really right because you know, i'm just not thinking about what 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 how to play it i'm just playing it and uh, so i'm hearing it set kind of independently of that mechanical action do you ever have moments when you uh, sort of wake up having been playing if you, like your conscious yeah, sometimes, your conscious certainly. brain like switches on and says like wow what did i just you do then you know i mean not 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 mechanically uh, you know in terms of the, the the fingers definitely do their own thing at this point um it is quite strange i really it's actually really hard to to um explain to people technique for me i would, I would be you know a you often get I have people ask, you know, do you, do you teach at all? And like, I will be the worst teacher in the world because I can't explain because I do not think about what I'm doing like at all. It just, it's like a completely independent action. So that stuff just happens. I don't know where I was, where I was I'm just going to leave it. It, it's, it, it works. <laughs> so it's fine. But yeah, certainly in terms of your, 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 your mental presence in a show. Yeah. Sometimes you do all of a sudden go, hey, wait, where am I? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Uh yeah, I mean it seems like you you talked about um a guitar that was given to you by um I've written down his name here somewhere. Kate Casey or Kaiser someone? His Henry 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 Kaiser. Henry Kaiser. Yeah, you talked about a, the, a guitar you were given that um you feel is possessed in some way. Yeah, so yeah, Henry Kaiser, he gave me ridiculously generously, he gave me uh a guitar of his uh from the dating back to i think it's like 1888 or something wow. from you know from the late 1800s which is crazy uh yeah and I, he, he gave it me when i was in the states and um yeah it's it's weird it's one of those guitars where you just when you play on it it you always play well like it's like it itself is telling you what what to do and how to be played honestly it's a bit of a scary because it's such a, an amazing guitar that and it's you know, obviously a proper antique that I'm kind of scared to play it at this point because I do have a bit of an aggressive style and I may be digging a hole in it so I need to be careful with it at this point and keep it for special occasions but certainly yeah I think but I think that's true for all good guitars I think all good all good guitars have got I've got demons in you know that I kind of got their own vibe that's why you know if you played every guitar plays plays differently because they've all got their own they've all got they've all got their own thing going on that they want to make you do I think same for tunings because they've all got their own thing they do and they're gonna make you do it <laughs> hopefully you know and if you're a good picker you should be listening right so. Yeah, I love that idea. I think that is really cool, and I, yeah, I do think. Um, I mean, it, in uh, in the world that I'm in, it's like synths, I guess, and um, yeah, you get a yeah. feeling of personality and and character uh, that's intangible, that's uh, and just also like I guess a, an attraction to a particular object or particular one that's you got some chemistry with. 
Yeah, totally. I mean, since since confused the hell out of me. There's too many, too many knobs, man. I, like, I got I got the six strings, and that that's 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 complicated. Enough. Yeah, I do occasionally play around with synths. I'm just bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I this, I think that's yeah. You've talked about like the purity of 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 just using the acoustic guitar, um, and that your second album, Strange Lights Over Garth Mountain, was recorded in your basement flat with a friend of yours who you paid in beer. Oh no! The first album was in, recorded in a, in in a well. There's 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 two there's two so the two the two albums are the first one was recorded in an attic flat with my friend who I paid. Oh right, okay. And the second album was rec- the second album was recorded in a basement flat, uh, which I recorded alone uh, because of we were in lockdown. Right. Well, I've combined. Sorry, I've combined the two albums into one recording process. That's <laughs> funny. Wow, you recorded that second album completely by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. It was all right, you know. You just sort of—it's kind of nice being on your own because you get to, you don't have to worry about anyone else. Because sometimes I get worried that you know, if I want to, a I don't like people, I don't like people looking at me when I'm trying to record. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like it's kind of sucks me out. And B, um, I just get concerned about time and is this other person annoyed by my obsession? And sometimes I don't obsess. Sometimes I'm, I'm quite I can be quite good at like going right. That was good enough. I'm going to shut up now because I kind of hate that. Uh, I kind of hate perfect sounding recordings. I think all of all of, all of that humanity is in, you know, finger scratches and you know an occasional duff note. I think is what humanizes a record. Versus if you've got if your record sounds perfect, you might as well have gotten a robot to play it. Like, what's the point? Exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, you've been an AI yeah. programmer. Um, I think there's a lot of electronic musicians yeah. that are quite worried that. Um, Soon they're going to be out of a job, and I don't think the, the AI is ever going to be able to play guitar like you can play the guitar. <laughs> Not for a little while. <laughs> That's so cool. No, I, I do love that the, you you dedicated. Um, yeah, you dedicated your your your. I don't know the word. I can't think of the word. Your craft to like the single instrument. I think that is amazing. Um, uh, amazing sort of level of determination and 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 dedication and purity. Um, it's also sort of quite anti-capitalist in a way. I, I suppose, yeah. I mean, it's it's. Well, I don't know. You might not say that given how many guitars I own. <laughs> <You've> <laughs> got like three hundred and seventy-two guitars. <laughs> Maybe not quite, but yeah, you know, you know. But it's, yeah, it's, it's more on. than one. Mm. <laughs> Mm. You 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 also spoke about having a, a a guitar with a painting of a dog on it, which was quite funny. Oh yeah, that's my uh, my uh, Bradley Kincaid Kincaid Hound Dog. But, yeah, quite a few of the tracks on the first album were recorded on that. It's a nice little nice little parlor from the twenties. Amazing. Yeah, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of. I was just sort of trying to articulate where um, this anti-capitalist idea thing uh, came from with with the way that you're performing by yourself and in fact recording by yourself as well and um i think we sort of get we get sort of conditioned in some way to to um rely on products to make us feel better or to replace Absolutely. replace feelings and um in in that happening in the world it's great that um yeah that you're just dedicating to that one instrument cuz you know lots of people i think who pick up a guitar the moment they discover pedals they just go, ah, oh, put a big reverb on it and I'll sound better. Put a chorus and I'll sound better. Put overdrive on it, I'll sound better. Um, I really admire that, the dedication you have to stick to the singular instrument. Yeah, well, I mean, it just means you have to... It, it just means you have to focus on composition, right? That's the whole thing, is that it's very easy to, to not... To think about... I mean, it, to be fair, like, I mean, like there are... There's plenty of of, of good music out there which is more about the the you know the sonic landscape versus you know uh, melodic composition that I, I, I like a lot of you know in fact you know uh, sort of synth and electronic music you know is 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 about kind of creating you know worlds of worlds of sound and soundscapes and that uh but i in terms of r- writing music myself yeah i like i like to do melodic uh composition and you that's all you can do it's kind of it's like the same as same as piano right and on the piano you you'd write a composition effectively on an acoustic guitar that's what you do it's 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 a composition mm. 
It's really, really cool. Um, and so, so the second album, which you recorded and released this year, Strange Lights Over Garth Mountain. Um, yeah, what, what was the process behind sort of the, um, putting that together? Um, well, in terms of writing it, it was just written over... A, I'm really slow at writing. Um, I'm not... You know, I, I take... I tend to not throw away many songs. Um, so what happens is songs kind of... I sort of do and I sort of don't. Usually, if I like... I can, I'll, I, you know, I might have an initial riff or whatever, uh, and I can't um, find a way to kind of turn that into an entire song. So it kind of... That, that sort of goes on the... Uh, it goes on the uh, on the backlog of of sounds as it were, but then often what will happen is it comes back. You know, you'll be you'll be noodling around with with some new bit, and all of a sudden you realize that this this thing you wrote six months ago actually you na- you really want to go into that. You kind of you know, obviously you've half remembered it, and then you go, oh no, I really want to play that now, and it kind of comes out of that. Uh, so uh, so the process really is just it's nothing particular. It's just playing a lot of guitar, and eventually you've got you've got a bunch of songs, and you go, all right, so this is. This is about, and you know, you don't. I well, I find that I don't have to think thematically about what I'm going to put on an album because typically, you know, all of the songs you've written in a certain period are naturally have a sim, you know, a thematic similarity between them because they've all been written at a, during a certain certain period, right? So you would hope that you kind of see an evol, uh, you know, you would see like an evolution of uh, of 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 a person's music through you know chronologically through their through their albums right um, and that's kind of interesting uh, but yeah I just you know I was playing lots of gigs and writing songs and that was it wasn't really anything special it was just it was just that and then went to went all right I've got I've got I've got enough to put on an album here I'm gonna I know I like them all and they've all they all seem to work together so I'm gonna put them on an album and then booked in the studio and then we got hit with COVID. So no more studio and I'm gonna record them in my flat. So yeah, that's what happened. Superb. Um where were you gonna record it? Did you have like a any like a grand studio planned? Where were you gonna record it? Oh, there's a guy called uh, called Ben, uh, Ben Walker in uh, in Brighton who is uh, he's a he's an also like an instrumental player and uh, he's he's got his own studio uh in in i think he he like owns two flats and he lives in one flat is the studio and the flat above it is his house nice and uh, i was going to record it uh with him uh but yeah obviously that didn't that didn't happen well you seem to do a pretty bloody good job on your own <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was pretty fun quite quite it was quite interesting i sort of you know figuring out cause i've done bits of recording before but actually trying to figure it out a bit more properly as it were how to how to do certain things is quite it's quite interesting. Obviously, I'm from a fairly technical background, so I was kind of interested in the physics of the acoustics and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I think you're someone I know who weaves, um, like, uh, rugs. She's in her 80s, and she said, like, one of the key things to her was to control the whole process as much as she could. Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, because... Um, often things would break or if you're relying on other people to do things for you it might not happen how you want it to happen um she articulated much better than i am now but yeah she said it's really important for her to um yeah to control as much of her process as she possibly can from from getting the wool from a sheep to yeah to making to having the rug finished it's wild yeah that's a good ethical production line yeah, um, and definitely be- really good for you to get a little bit of knowledge in 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 the other the other sort of stuff. Obviously, we've we've had a really strange year, um, and you did you did like a YouTube event to promote the album. Yeah, which, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, how was that? How was that as a performance? Have you had you done had you done anything like that before? Uh, yeah, so I I I played a. Um a couple of yeah live stream shows before and recorded some like live live and some pre-recorded and put into to, onto roll for for the events um yeah i mean i to be honest i i'm not a huge fan of those live stream shows i do think they kind of you know obviously atmosphere is a very very important part of uh a gig and that's pretty much completely missing uh, in a live stream. Although, you know, there's a certain... I was saying this to someone else the other day. There's a certain uh, 
like Lynchian nightmare quality to that kind of playing into the void vibe, which is which is interesting. Um, it has its own aesthetic, certainly, but I don't think I don't think I'd want it permanently over over uh, real gigs. I mean, the the, the, sh- the the gig I did for the release was a bit different because it had a a more uh, you know it had a more th- uh, of, 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 of a theme running through it, which I I was I just played the the whole album in order, uh, so it wasn't. You know, you, you you were kind of not that I talk much in gigs at all or at all. In fact, <laughs> um, but you can. It was you know the, the fact that you're playing a whole album from you know from start to finish gives it a bit more of an intensity and purpose that I think kind of maybe hopefully hopefully yeah give it a bit of more of an atmosphere than your here's six you know random songs that you know, a lot of other sort of live streams can be. Yeah, I th- I think it I think you it's it's an amazing stream. I've watched it a couple of times and I do think that you've got you you know there is there is atmosphere to it a bit like you said a bit of a like a I think to anyone who's streaming there is like an it's sort of like a, an uncanny valley gig, isn't it? Live streaming. Sort yeah, of like it looks strange. real but it isn't real and you're not sure about it. But yeah, I think I think you definitely um yeah, you definitely did that justice and you know, ev- there's so much adulation going on through your performance, like everyone's loving it and um yeah, I think you did tremendously well to have recorded that album, released it and performed it live, you know, pretty much single handedly. I think that's um that's no mean feat. Yeah, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, um, just to pick up on one, I mean, this is not something that I've nicked off um, Adam Buxton at all, but just to pick up on one YouTube comment, um, just because um, it's it's something like I asked you earlier about the alternate, the alter, the alternate bass, alternating thumb style. So someone's written, uh, is she actually tremolo picking with her thumb? While continue the continuing the picking pattern with the the index finger and middle finger, he's written triple question mark after that. Is wh- are you doing that? What is tremolo I, picking? I don't even know what. I I mean I, I don't know how you would tremolo picking with it. I do I don't even know what that question means. Tremolo. I thought tremolo picking was when you did like the which would require all you can't do that with your thumb mate. can you do that yeah i don't know what that question means oh brilliant oh. probably not then is the answer <laughs> i'm glad um i'm glad that we're on the same page with that because i thought wow tremolo picking that just sounds that sounds amazing i mean i don't even i couldn't even begin to imagine how you would do that um oh, wait, let me bear in mind i my my um musical uh technical th- you know theory is absolutely awful <laughs> you know i know no words for any of the things i can't read music i don't know i don't know all, what yeah my, my knowledge of musical language is basically zero yeah you've i think you've rendered it um redundant you don't need it you know you've, you've gone beyond it <laughs> that's that's useful then <laughs> So um, yeah, there's a video that you recorded in your father's house. Yeah, the uh, uh, sometimes there's blood video. Yeah, absolutely superb. It's got like a really gothic vibe to it. Yeah, um, what yeah. made you decide to record the video there? Um, well, it was actually my my my, my mother's idea. Uh, my mother's a my mother's a retired filmmaker, so it's not coming out of not coming out of nowhere. I mean, she shot, right, wow. she shot and edited the whole thing. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's so I'm, I'm just too cheap to pay people to do things. So everything, because everything comes out of talents that my family. Mom, has. can you edit my video for me? Yeah, basically. <laughs> I would love to see what happened if I'd say that to my mum. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was just one of those things where we we you know needed to do a video. It was like right, shit. What 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 is there interesting? And then. She, yeah, she came up with this thing because my yeah, my father's house is full of uh, taxidermied animals on account that he uh, he paints and he likes to paint animals and they're a lot easier to paint if they if they don't move. Definitely, that's cool. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I love all like the marionettes, the sort of the characters that are in it as well. They've all oh, got like yeah. really spooky eyes and um. Yeah, it, those are um. Just, those are probably Sicilian puppets, I think. Are they? And um, yeah, you've sort of got a deadpan, deadpan delivery, like just looking at the camera. Um, it's really well shot and it's beautifully edited. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's, it's well, you know, it's, it's useful having talented family family members. Has your what other films has your mum worked on? Oh, well, she she um uh, was like co-owned with a bunch of other women at a production company uh, in in the South Wales Valleys, uh, sort of in in the in the early nineties. Mostly did like documentaries and stuff for for Channel Four and that. Oh, cool! Any interesting what any interesting documentaries you'd recommend? Um, well, shit, a bunch of stuff. I mean, um, they're all very very Welsh. So, uh, things like um. Things like well, I think Mam is the best known one, which was about uh, women, but uh, women in the Welsh Valleys between the between the wars. Excellent. Yeah, I really love that. Um, the way that video shot and um, <clears throat> yeah, the tone, the atmosphere of it. It's, um, it's yeah, it's superb. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you've also um, we've talked a lot about the American American primitive style. Or um, yeah, but also like there is a connection of your music with Indian ragas as well. I think yeah. I mean, this is to be. I mean, to be honest, like the American primitive that that's a very common theme as well. Uh, I I don't know. It's not something I've intentionally done, but I I agree that it's definitely it's definitely there. And I don't think it's from um, even necessarily from listening to other american primitive i think maybe it's just something that falls naturally out of that style i think and that it kind of has that and you come out with that with that sound that comes out like raga yeah i don't know why but it's definitely it's definitely a, a thing yeah that's present in 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 my stuff and in a lot of uh yeah american primitive records but not necessarily because we've all been listening to each other just because <laughs> that seems to be what happens absolutely yeah um I think it's a, it's sort of like a dream like it's like a dream like adventure like an unknown dream like adventure when you're listening to uh repetitive music like that. Yeah, there's certainly a, a you know there's a trance element to it, isn't it? Isn't there? It's like that uh yeah, meditative stuff. You listen listen to some uh uh, uh Master uh Wilburn Burchett if you want to hear uh med- meditation guitar man, that stuff's wild. Really? Yeah, yeah, he's um, he was a guitar player. Um, I think he was from the from the seventies, I think it was, who uh, thought that. Um, so he kind of figured that the universe was made of vibrations, and that guitar, well, and that music, and he was a guitar player, obviously. So, therefore, his guitar uh, could you know create vibrations. It could therefore like control space and time. So he thought he had you know he he invent he built his own guitar out of these different five different woods and he built his own tremolo pedal and he was co- he was convinced that you know he basically could un, un could manipulate harmonics to like unlock the godhead. Wow, it's crazy. It's, <laughs> it's just it's also just really cool music, man. When was he around? I think that would be in the seventies. That sounds great. I'm really looking forward to it listening to some of that and just zoning out <laughs> yes yeah, it's, it's yeah, you, you will i mean it's hard not to <laughs> you also had a gig at a place called union chapel in islington yes which yes. is online which absolutely looks like the most amazing venue yeah it's crazy it's just well it's a huge chapel yeah with amazing um stainless uh, amazing stained glass everywhere uh you know obviously uh incredible acoustics yeah, that was um they put on a lot of shows in that in that in that venue. It's 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 definitely yeah, probably one of the best venues in London. Yeah, it looked amazing. It's like um I don't know if it's have you ever been to the you must have been to the Cardiff Castle. Sure. And yeah, I mean when I was a kid. Yeah, they've got the like a walnut. There's like a whole wall that's been carved out of walnut. Right, and it, oh, I don't remember. I've, honestly, I've not been there since I was like an actual child. So, yeah, um, it's just like really ornately carved, and there's a whole wall of it in like the main dining room in Cardiff Castle. And um, it really, for a split second, I thought you might be there, but it's yeah, it's um, uh, yeah, it's in Islington. 
Yeah, no, it's amazing. Definitely worth worth worth. Always got good cake as well. Good cake. <laughs> Great venue. Good cake. <laughs> like. There's the two things that like I need. What what we want is really good acoustics and some great cake, and then best Absolutely. best gig ever. What Definitely. sort of cake do you like? Uh, ooh, I'm I'm actually I'm open. I'm very I'm very cake curious. <laughs> um, I will eat any sort of cake. I like your, your I like a good lemon cake. That's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent, cool, and yeah, other 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 venues that were up there was the one you mentioned before. The was it the Rhizome in Tacoma? Rhizome, yeah, yeah, that's in uh, in, yeah, in Tacoma Park. Uh, not not there's like America has got like there's because because of the way it is, it's just you know I think I think there is a Tacoma as well, but it's the other coast, so it's Tacoma Park. Oh, okay. No, no, Tacoma, no, 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 Tacoma is below. I don't know. They got too many places that have got very very similar names in the states. Is it near Hell for like, Certain? Uh, I, yeah, I think you can get the train. No, I don't know. <laughs> I want to look up some more place names like that. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, hang on. No, no, no. That's from no. No, never mind. Excellent. Ah, god damn it! It's driving me nuts. I'm trying to remember like there's this one which is amazing and it's 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 completely it's completely. Yeah, I mean we've got some good ones in England. There are some funny place names in England. I think my my friend lives in. Um, he lives near Cambridge, and and he lives in a place called Six Mile Bottom. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty, <laughs> it's good. pretty decent. Yeah, uh, it's not as good as hell for certain, though. That is that no, that no. that definitely takes the biscuit. Cool. So, um, yeah, a, yeah. It's, I mean, it's difficult to predict anything in the future, and I don't really like to put any pressure on on you to sort of do a next thing but like what are you yeah. are you um i don't know what my question is there really i don't know if there is one <laughs> <laughs> I, just... I mean yeah i have i have nominally trying to book shows in the new year but obviously it's all super you kind of have to have to plan that it is very likely won't happen so it's it's pretty it's pretty much impossible to 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 plan fully at this point i think yeah but you especially with brexit definitely yeah with visas it's going to be looks like it might be complicated but um well you've already i think you've already established that you can um perform from your own living room uh comfortably with (laughs) and, and very very successfully so um yeah um no, I really, really like. I really, really love your music. I did buy your album on vinyl um, this week just because I think it's it's oh, really, yeah. really incredible. No, oh, thank you very do much. Do you have Do you have like any uh, mantra that you live by or philosophy on life? <laughs> um, not no, <laughs> not really. I don't know. I was like, you know, just don't don't try not and worry so much, man. That's a good one. That is important. Don't worry. Yeah. Don't worry. I mean, you should worry because the world's falling apart. But also, you know, worry about that bit. But don't worry about the don't worry about the bits that don't matter. Definitely. I like that you you're the first person other than um I've been calling it the apocalypse all year, and you're the first person I hear also call what happened this year the apocalypse. Yeah. So um yeah no, exactly it it is it is <laughs> good. <laughs> Well, um, I really, lo- I'm really looking forward to seeing you play live when it all happens again. Huh. Yeah. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to playing live. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for speaking to me today. Um, oh, thank you very and, much. And um, yeah, long may you continue to record your albums from your living room to critical acclaim. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Yeah. And, uh, best of luck with, uh, with with your show. Thank you. What an amazing talent Gwenifer is. Um, Unbelievable dedication. Uh, I I really admire that dedication to this singular instrument that she does with so many people, sort of with gas, with gear acquisition. She's got one instrument and she just has mastered that and that's such a great blueprint, I think, for um, 
really creating something very special, which she definitely does do. Okay, so uh, yeah, please check out the GoFundMe page uh, if you want to support the podcast. It does help me out a lot. Next episode, we're going to speak to uh, someone who's worked in management. So he's worked in uh, managed bands as well as DJs. Uh, he's had a 28 year career in the industry. So that's going to be a really, really good chat because we talk about sort of a lot of psychology and things like that, which is really up my street. Excellent. So thank you very much for listening. Check out the GoFundMe page if you want to. And um, yeah, see you soon.